This Christmas, while visiting Oahu, I stumbled across something that really fits in well with electromagnetic videos, and that's the Lua Lua Le VLF transmitter site. If you happen to be driving from Honolulu up the west coast of Oahu, you may notice two large radio masts. They're even more noticeable in the evening or at night because of the flashing lights on the towers. And it's a bit deceptive because they don't seem particularly high, at least for a standard radio or TV tower. And that's probably because of the mountains in the background. They're actually enormously tall. And it's not exactly a secret what these towers are. Google Maps labels them as VLF Array Lua Lua Le. There also are numerous web pages and documents available online about that site. And I'll put the links in the description. Well, Knowing that they're not just some form of local TV or radio transmitter, we drove up to see them. The two masts are 458 meters high. That's about 1,500 feet. Really quite amazing. And they were built in 1972, although the site dates back to the 1930s. To put things in perspective, the CN Tower in Toronto is 553 meters, only 20% taller than the masts, and the Eiffel Tower at just over a thousand feet is only two-thirds as high. So think about that. The antennas are umbrella antennas. That means the upper guy wires are split in half with insulators and the upper parts form an umbrella shape as part of the active antenna. You can actually see how an antenna like this is structured more easily on the battleship Missouri in Pearl Harbor. It has a nice but much smaller HF umbrella antenna that you can get a good close look at. The antennas and everything around them at Lua Lua Le are huge in comparison and that's because they're for the VLF band, very low frequency which is defined as 3 to 30 kilohertz with a wavelength from 6 to 60 miles. So really low frequencies, so low in fact that they're really the upper audio bands that we speak in, well, maybe we don't speak at those frequencies, but we speak almost at those frequencies, and ultrasonic going up to 30 kilohertz. 15 kilohertz is the type of squeal you used to get from old TV CRTs when the TV was on. Well, this antenna uses 21.4 kilohertz and 23.4 kilohertz to transmit. So it's sort of in the upper part of the VLF band. And 20 kilohertz is, well, at the upper range of human hearing. So if you are a young person with exceptional hearing, you might be able to attach a long wire to some headphones and actually hear the signals when they're being transmitted without even any form of receiver. Even with everything so large, the antenna structures are still only a fraction of the wavelength. And that's why the umbrellas are used. The umbrella wires behave like a capacitor and make the very short antenna carry a bit more current and become a more efficient RF radiator. What we can't see are the huge ground planes. Presumably an array of wires is buried below the antennas in the ground which actually reflects the antenna itself just like a mirror would. And that creates a virtual other half of the antenna. Even with all of that, the antennas are still very capacitive, and that gets countered by using a giant loading coil apparently inside the hexagonal building. If you look at my video on Ohm's Law for AC circuits with resistors, capacitors, and inductors, well, this is exactly what we did with the RLC circuit, where the inductor and capacitor canceled each other. And like in that demo, you end up with very high voltages across the inductor and the capacitor, which in this case is our antenna, and it's probably in the hundreds of kilovolts. Look at the giant insulators. They're all indications of the high voltages involved. One of the documents I read even talked about evaluating corona discharge, where the voltages get so high that electrons are stripped from the air molecules with a characteristic fizz and a blue glow. And that, of course, removes some of the power that should otherwise be transmitted. That's probably also why we see circular clusters of wires instead of just one thin cable to distribute the electric fields over a larger radius and reduce the likelihood of corona discharge. 
There's probably another reason for the wire clusters, and that's the skin effect. Higher frequency signals can't penetrate into the conductors, so this cable geometry makes the cable look like a big thick cable, and the wire can flow nicely on the individual conductors around that virtual conductor's boundary. The skin depth is also why VLF is used to penetrate into the ocean salt water for submarine communications. And that's the whole reason for these transmitters. But more on that later. There are clearly other antenna arrays on the same site. Look at these. And these. The antennas are much shorter, and that's just in comparison. They're also huge, in fact. Just look at the buildings next to them. And they're probably for the HF band. That's 3 to 30 megahertz which provides round-the-world communications by bouncing the radio waves back and forth between the ocean surface and the ionosphere. Before the internet, that's how we got news when we were in distant lands, and the consumer name for that was shortwave radio. It's also neat to see the architecture of the old buildings, the round ones. It really does have a pre-World War II type look, probably from the 30s or 40s, and certainly looks way better than what we'd probably build today. So why does the Navy have these VLF transmitters? Well, as I mentioned before, to communicate with submarines at depth, and that typically means 10 to 40 meters or 30 to 130 feet for these types of frequencies. And that's because of the skin effect. For low frequencies, we can penetrate radio waves into salt water. If we had a good conductor, like copper or aluminum, even those frequencies wouldn't penetrate in very deeply at all, probably no more than a couple of millimeters or so. But for salt water, well, these fields can go down, and the lower the frequency, the deeper they will penetrate. And, well, that's why they're so useful. We not only use VLF for communicating with subs, but also ELF, extremely low frequency, essentially one-tenth of the VLF frequencies, and they can penetrate even deeper. But the problem with both of these bands is the data rates are very, very low. Probably for VLF, we're lucky if we can get maybe hundreds or possibly even thousands of bits per second on a good day. And, well, ELF would be a tenth of that. A bit over a year ago, there was that horrible disaster where that tourist submarine imploded while visiting the Titanic. And I did a video about this form of communication. And, well, there should be a link up somewhere on the left side of the video screen if you're interested in seeing it. And we went into it with quite a bit more detail. And I also did a demo where I put a cell phone in a plastic bag and we submerged it in a cooking Pyrex container, and sure enough, we saw the RF signal going to the cell phone disappear. Well, since I have this nifty EM sniffer that Tesman sent me a while ago, I thought it would be fun to try a similar experiment, taking advantage of the sniffer's much nicer signal strength display. So, here is the sniffer, and, well, links in the description if you want one. As you can see, it detects things like Wi-Fi rather nicely. My submarine is this old coffee jar and a plastic bag that keeps the sniffer from the bottom of the submarine in case our vessel develops a leak. Never a good thing when you're submerged. I also don't trust the seal on the lid, so I used electrical tape to make sure water didn't get through any possible cracks. I wanted to use Wi-Fi for this demo, but I found that the signal strength from the router wasn't sufficient to penetrate distilled water at 2.4 gigahertz. So instead, I dug up this old signal generator and found that at about 1.3 gigahertz, it worked pretty well. So here I add some distilled water, and the signal strength goes way down. Some of it's lost due to skim depth attenuation, but a lot is lost due to reflections. Just like for light, radio waves are reflected on the water surfaces, both the surface where the RF enters the water and also the surface where it goes into the glass jar. But there's still enough RF to see it nicely on the meter. Now watch what happens when I add some salt. The water becomes more conductive and the signal strength goes down, eventually to almost zero. And that's because the skin depth for our gigahertz signal 
is now less than the depth of our submarine. I should point out that skin depth is not a precise boundary. At a depth of one skin depth, the EM field drops to about a third of the original value, or a tenth of the power. And one more skin depth is one third of that. So, for Lua Lua Lay signals, my guess is the skin depth in seawater is about 10 meters or 30 feet, depending on the amount of salinity in that part of the ocean. So that's a quick look at the Lua Lua Lay VLF station, and it's certainly well worth the drive if you're exploring the west side of Oahu. The demo I did with the Tessman RF sniffer should work nicely in a classroom, and particularly because of its large signal strength display, certainly way easier to see than a few bars on a cell phone, particularly if you're at the back of the classroom. What you do need is a decent RF signal generator. And although I used a traditional lab one, an inexpensive software-defined radio that's easily available these days should work just as nicely. I hope you enjoyed this video, and if you did, please consider subscribing. That's probably the best thing you can do to support a small channel like this one. And if you have questions or comments, well, put them below. And in particular, if you have some insider knowledge about VLF transmissions, either from this station or from the perspective of a submarine, it would be fantastic to hear from you. And if you do have suggestions for future videos, please send me an email. That wraps this video up, and see you next time.